Okay, hello again, everybody. Uh, I just want to continue the discussion of uh, two-way ANOVA uh, by giving you an example of how two-way ANOVA works in practice. Uh, so we looked at one example at the end of the first half of this lecture where uh, we were seeing if stop, uh, place of articulation, and vowel had a, um, an effect on the VOT from the class VOT data from a couple years ago. And we found out that uh, stop uh, does, the stop place of articulation does have an effect, but nothing else does, not the vowel nor the interaction between them. And I mentioned uh, that there is uh, an interaction effect that I know of that comes from the world of baseball. So this is going to be a lecture about baseball or a half of a lecture about baseball. Uh, and for that reason, um, if you <laughs> don't care about learning too much about baseball, you might want to skip ahead uh, through the first, I don't know how many minutes of this lecture until I get to the uh, statistical stuff. Uh, and I also mentioned uh, on top of that, that um, this is just an example to see how this works um, in practice. So uh, if you don't <laughs> care about baseball to the extent that you don't even want to think about it whatsoever, you could skip this whole thing and probably get away with it. But the goal of this um, is to give you an example of an interaction in real life that is you know, robust, uh, and also show you how the math of the two-way ANOVA um, stats work. Uh, the math works for uh, calculating the statistics involved in two-way ANOVA, uh, and then we'll see the kind of easy way of interpreting it, or of running the ANOVA and interpreting the results at the tail end of this lecture as well. Um, so that's what we're doing for the next 13 or 14 slides or so. So, and like I said, uh, it's gonna be about baseball. So this is a, um, an interaction that I've known about my whole life because uh, if you know me at all, you know that I am a sports fan. Uh, and in particular, for a long time in my life, I was very interested in baseball, which um, is um, an old-fashioned agrarian game that most people find boring, but I think is extremely interesting. Um, yeah, and it's funny how it works uh, in the modern day and age because baseball is a game where there's lots of dead time in between brief moments of action and people think that that should be like just totally untenable in the modern day and age where everybody's staring at their phones but I'm always like whatever I can do work while nothing is happening in the game and then every once in every two three minutes I can look at something going on uh, and find out what's happening it works perfectly fine <laughs> as a companion while you're trying to get something done uh, anyways I'm not going to give you an ad for the game I'm good but if you don't know how it works and it turns out that a lot of students in my class don't know how baseball works and maybe haven't even heard about the game at all uh, I will explain it to you in the next couple of minutes if you already know how it works again you can skip ahead uh, but this is the point I think um, at which my wife who took the first version of this class kind of gave up on the class because she had no idea what baseball was and I just kind of dove into it and she's like what the heck uh, so I'm going to explain it in basic detail if you are like my wife uh, so that you don't drop the class but actually can see how these numbers function um, as we walk through the example okay so baseball it takes its name from the four bases which are found on its plane surface. So um, I've got a little um, graphic here of what a baseball playing field looks like. Um, it's actually called a diamond uh, because the four bases are these white spots and they're arranged in this, um, well, it's a square quadrilateral pattern, uh, but they're, it's kind of on its edge because it starts here at what is called home plate. Uh, and this is a bit like the, um, the Odyssey <laughs> is one way to think about it, where you leave home, uh, go, far, go as far away as you can, and then the goal is to get all the way back home, and then you score what is called a run. So that may be a bit overblown way to say it, uh, but that's just a matter of fact how the game works. Uh, so <laughs> it's epic. Um, I have an example here. This is actually a website I ran for... Um, I still run. I've been running for over 20 years now. I haven't done much with it in the past two. You can see the last update was May 2019. But I'm only uh, drawing your attention to it, not only because I really like baseball stats and uh, crunching the numbers. Actually, kind of the thing that's really attractive to people who are baseball fans is that baseball produces a lot of numbers. Yeah, so that's how it kind of ties into this class. But if you want to see what a base looks like, <laughs> this is a base. It's kind of like a padded little square that sits on top of the ground. And if you get to that base, you're supposed to stand on that, you know, put your foot on the base, uh, and then you're safe. I don't want to get too far afield, though, here. So just the idea is you start at home, and you go around in this square. And if you get all the way back home, you score a run or a point. Uh, so each offensive player enters the game at that spot. 
and it's supposed to go around in this order, first, second, third, so on and so forth, uh, and then back home again. Um, the team that scores the most runs wins the game. The team that succeeds in getting all the way around the most times wins the game. That's the basic idea. But play starts when um, a pitcher on the defensive team throws a ball towards the offensive player at home plate. So if you're an offensive player, you stand here or here in one of these boxes with a big stick in your hand, which says that you mean business. Uh, and then there are nine defensive players scattered throughout this field. Uh, there's one standing on this mound. There's literally literally a bump in the middle of the field, uh, and he will throw a ball towards the uh, towards home plate. And it's the goal of the guy with the stick in his hand to hit it with that stick, uh, which is normally called a bat. <laughs> so the guy throwing the ball is called a pitcher. The guy holding the stick or the bat is called a batter. Uh, and it's fun to just try to hit that ball. <laughs> um, yeah, so as people have pointed out, this is a very odd game because uh, it's maybe the only team game. Well, not the only team game, but one of the few team games out there that uh, the offensive players are not allowed to um, touch the ball with their hands. Uh, and only the defense can touch the ball with their hands. Uh, I'm also going to point out that I am um, using gendered language here. Uh, and I'm using, using the masculine pronouns throughout. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is because... Um, all the data I have come from the uh, the male professional leagues um, for baseball, but also baseball is a uh, kind of gendered sport in a weird way because there's a version that women or girls play called softball, which is very similar, but not quite the same. Uh, it's used, it uses a different style of ball and, or a larger ball and it's thrown or pitched in a different way as well. Uh, and the field dimensions are different, so on and so forth. So generally speaking, men play baseball, women play softball. That being said, uh, I had a friend, or I still have a friend from high school who uh, went on to play women's baseball in Chicago after uh, she graduated from college. So that the sport does exist for women. Um, I'm just going to use the the male pronouns throughout because it's almost always the case that men are playing the game. Um, and I'm going to actually, actually add another linguistic note to that too. Something I learned in moving to Canada is that uh, generally speaking, Canadians will refer to softball as baseball, uh, which to me is a bit funny. Uh, so it's very common, not many people actually, outside of, you know, little kids and people trying to make their way through sort of the uh, amateur and professional ranks will play baseball. If you're doing it just as sort of a uh, recreational sport, everybody will normally play softball. So that's one case where it's no longer gendered for just, you know, adult recreational players. But um, when a lot of Canadians play softball, it, just like a lot of Americans play softball, but when the Canadians play softball, they often call it baseball, uh, which, I, like I said, to me, is just a, a funny dialectal or language variation thing, which doesn't make any sense. But, you know, when in Rome or when in Calgary, do as the Calgarians do. Um, and I felt like I had another thing to add to that. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's a bit like um, in Canada, if you say hockey, that means ice hockey. Uh, and then you have to specify like field hockey, right? So if you were to say like, call field hockey hockey in Canada, you might get a lot of confusion. And I, I was confused quite a bit when Canadians started talking about people playing baseball. And I just assumed they meant baseball when they meant softball. Uh, anyways, that was too much of a digression for statistical purposes. So I'll just say what's happening here is that the pitcher will throw a ball towards the batter at home plate and the batter will try to hit it. Uh, that is the kind of main mechanism of the game. The goal for the batter is to hit it within these two white lines, which are called foul lines. Um, and if he does that, it's called the the hit of the ball is called fair. Uh, and he can try to run to first base. And if he gets to first base and the defense hasn't picked up the ball or caught it, he can keep running to second or third or maybe even home again. Um, so he can keep running as long as he feels like the defense is not going to catch up with him. Um, and there's also another way to get to first base, which is if the uh, pitcher hits him with the ball on a pitch, or if the pitcher throws four unhittable pitches, which are called balls, before throwing him three hittable pitches, which are called strikes. This is all just in case you want to know how the game works. What we are going to be focusing on in this problem set is the issue of how many bases the batter reaches every time he comes to the plate and tries to make it to first base. So sometimes he might just make it to first. Sometimes he might not make it anywhere. Like if you hit the ball and the defense catches it, you're out and you go nowhere. Um, if you hit it a long way, you might go to second base or even third or even all the way around to home. So we're just going to count how many bases the batters reach on each 
plate appearance each time they appear in the game. Um, yeah, so I'm going to show you a video of how this works in case you've never seen this before, and we're going to cut straight to the good stuff. So this is a relatively famous player known as Bryce Harper collecting his first ever Major League Baseball hit. Um, I don't know how many years ago, but here we go. The pitcher is going to throw the ball. He's going to hit it. He's going to run. And it goes all the way out to the outfield fence. You might have seen it's 395 feet away from home plate. And he makes it all the way to second base. He loses his hat on the way and feels proud of himself because now he's a major leaguer. Okay, right. Uh, he went on to get many, many more hits beyond that. So good job, Bryce. That's how the game works. <laughs> I think I got that video from YouTube. So hopefully I'm not going to incur any like copyright violations by playing a YouTube video on YouTube. But anyways, um, oh, uh, a little point I can make. We can go back to that video. Um, and in the video, you might see the pitcher is throwing with his right hand and the batter is hitting left-handed. So we'll go back to the start, right? So the pitcher is throwing right-handed. If you are left-handed, you will stand on this side of home plate, which is down here. Uh, if you're right-handed, you stand over here. Um, so voila, it may not be obvious that he's a left-handed batter, but he is. Um, baseball is kind of a funny little game because there's a, like a lot of little advantages you get from being left-handed. Uh, generally speaking, if you're a left-hander, you have a lot of advantages in um, team sports or sports in general. Um, so maybe that's one reason why left-handers keep emerging uh, in the human world. But <clears throat> one of the funny little advantages <clears throat> excuse me, you get from being left-handed in baseball is that you stand in this box here uh, and that puts you just that much closer to first base uh, if you want to get to first base, a little closer than a right-hander would be. So it's not all bad news, left-handers, as you know, even though you're living in a predominantly right-handed world. Okay, so with all this in mind, <clears throat> I want to take a look at some baseball data I compiled some 10 years ago. So we'll load this up in R, uh, and this is data I grabbed um, or I compiled for my website, which has a unique paradigm of baseball statistics, uh, which we're going to play around with a bit here. Uh, and I put this together the first time I taught this class 10 years ago. Uh, and what this data set has in it are two statistics for every team that played in the 2010 Major League Baseball season. So Major League ba Baseball is the highest level of the sport. Uh, in the U.S. and Canada, uh, and I've got um, data here, four observations for each team. There are 30 teams in the major leagues, uh, starting with the Arizona Diamondbacks. Uh, what I've got here are how many plate appearances uh, each team had for a certain combination of batters and pitchers. So out of all the times, all the games that uh, were played in a season, and teams play a lot of games in a baseball season, 162, uh, and then there's even playoffs on top of that. So it's quite a lot of games in over a six-month period. Uh, so there were 745 plate appearances by left-handed batters facing left-handed pitchers for this team in that season. And on those 745 plate appearances, uh, those batters reached 375 total bases in some combination. Um, so this second statistic, this first one is um, a commonly known one. It's called plate appearance. It's just like if you appear in the game, uh, we'll count it. Uh, the second one is called batting bases produced. Um, it's just how many bases you reach, uh, which is kind of unique to my system. And you'd think it would be more common, but people haven't figured it out yet because nobody pays attention to my baseball statistics. So tell your friends if they like baseball, go to the site. Uh, anyways, the last statistic that matters, the one we're going to play around with is this one called average. And I'm sorry that the... Um, kind of tabs don't work there. We can look at the summary in here. It'll tell us the same thing. We have this stat called AVG for average, uh, and it's basically this number, batting bases produced, divided by this number, the plate appearances. So it's about 0.5 in this case, 375 divided by 745. Uh, and then we look through the four different combinations of handednesses here. So when we have a left-handed batter, right-handed pitcher, right-handed batter, left-handed pitcher, so on and so forth uh, for each team in the major leagues. Um, and uh, yeah, so you can, you know, there's a lot to say there. Uh, it's nice to get into the minutia. That's part of the fun of the game, uh, but I won't bore you too much with it. Uh, what I want to focus on is give you definitions there. Um, <clears throat> does the team average 
depend on the handedness of the pitcher and or batter. So we've got these stats for plate appearances, batting bases produced, and then divide one by the other to get an average. Does that average depend on the handedness of the pitcher and or batter? I was just saying a second ago that if you're left-handed in baseball, you have a number of little advantages. Well, does that affect your average? Does that affect how many bases you reach every time you enter the game? Compelling question I know for you and me as linguists, who cares? But if you're in baseball, there's millions of dollars at stake. So who knows? It might allow you to win a few more games and make a little bit more money or maybe just have a little more fun. So we're going to address this question by running a two-way ANOVA. So we'll start by taking a look at the data. Um, and I've mentioned this before, but it's always good to both run a quantitative analysis on your data and take a look at what it looks like just to get a sense of what it might be showing you or trying to tell you. And here we go. So this is plotting average on the y dimension here. And on the x dimension, we're plotting the handedness combinations of batter and pitcher. So LL just means we have a left-handed batter, left-handed pitcher combination. And the average in that case is just over 0.4. Uh, and then we look on the second column here, we get a right-handed batter and a left-handed pitcher. And all of a sudden, the average seems to shoot up. Uh, the median's about 0.46 something maybe. Uh, it looks relatively high for this combo as well, which is sort of the opposite um, or mismatch combination, the handedness there. Uh, and then for the righty versus righty matchup, um, it seems to go back down a little bit. So just by eyeballing this, um, the way we see it, it looks like if the batter and pitcher match in handedness, then um, the average is not so high. But if they are not matched in handedness, like we saw in that video, uh, then the average seems to go up. But is that significant or not? Since we're doing the exercise, you can guess, well, probably, but let's see how the math works to make us, to allow us to get there. So what I'm going to do is walk you through the math sort of painstakingly, and then at the end, you'll see the easy way to do it. But just this is just kind of to see um, how the, all these equations at the end of the previous lecture uh, actually work out in practice, all this stuff. Um, so we'll start out by subsetting this data into different groups based on the handedness of the batter and pitcher. So I've got BL for left-handed batters and BR for right-handed batters, PL for left-handed pitchers, so on and so forth. Um, yeah, that is, right, just based on those two variables in the original data set, batter and pitcher. That's all that they specify. And I'm also gonna do this for the combinations. So I'll do this first and then I'll kind of go back to show you the uh, sort of analog or the parallel um, in our two-way ANOVA model. So uh, you can kind of think of this, we have two, in a two-way ANOVA model, we have two main effects. We can think of alpha here as the batter effect. Um, there's two handednesses for the batter, right? So alpha sub one might be left-handed batters, alpha sub two would be right-handed, so on and so forth. We get a similar sort of pattern for beta, which we can think of as our pitchers. We have, you know, left-handed pitchers, right-handed pitchers. Uh, and then we have the potential for interactions. So this is the um, alpha-beta combo, right? So uh, we can look at like uh, alpha sub one, beta sub one, alpha sub one, beta sub two, so on and so forth. That translates into like left-handed batters combined with right-handed pitchers or left-handed batters combined with left-handed pitchers, so on and so forth. Uh, so we're going to get specific data just when they're combined and then also when they're independent. So these are sort of addressing the main effects here uh, and these are addressing the interactions. <clears throat> okay, so what I want to do is calculate treatment effects for our two main effects. Um, and uh, we'll just do that by looking at the mean of one factor level average uh, minus the mean of the, the grand mean, the overall average for the entire data set. So that is looking at this sort of treatment effect right there. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice isn't cooperating today. But for each level <clears throat> in the alpha factor or the batter factor, I need to calculate one of these treatment effects. So just the mean of the right-handed batter's average minus the grand mean. Likewise, the mean of the uh, left-handed batter's average minus the grand mean average, so on and so forth. Um, so we'll calculate those and we'll do that for the interactions as well. Um, actually, I'll pause here. Uh, and before I do it for the interactions, I'll show you 
what these treatment effects look like. And maybe you can tell me what's going on here. So the treatment effect for right-handed batters is 0.003. That's pretty small. We can take a look actually. Our overall average is 0.450. So when you're right-handed batter, you get a modest benefit for that. What happens for um, the left-handed batters? Oh, it's negative 0.003. And isn't that kind of funny? Because it looks like this is exactly the same number as this, but it's negative. Hmm, why does that happen? Um, then there's also the pitcher effect. So for right-handed pitchers, uh, the overall average goes up a little bit. Um, and then for left-handed pitchers, it goes down. Oh, isn't that funny? This number for left-handed pitchers is exactly the same as it is for right-handed pitchers, except we have a negative sign in front. Hmm, <clears throat> what could be going on there? Um, I will say, as you puzzle over that, basically this is saying the opposite of what I told you before, that the right-handed batters seem to have a bit of an advantage here, uh, a very modest advantage over the left-handed batters because this is negative. But over here, it looks like the left-handed pitchers who want average to go down um, have an advantage over the right-handed pitchers. But it, it's a little bit more maybe because it's 0 0.008 rather than 0 0.003. Um, yeah, but why are these like exactly the same number? Hmm, go figure. Let's calculate similar numbers for the interaction treatment effect. Um, and let's take a look at those. But before we do, I'll just show you that um, what we're doing here is looking at the mean for the combination of these factors. So like right-handed pitchers, right-handed batters. And then I subtract that from uh, the grand mean plus the treatments for both of those factor levels. So I add the treatments for uh, right-handed batters and left or right-handed pitchers. Uh, and then based on this entire combination, I subtract that from what I'm getting for the specific mean of those factors when they're put together. So that's this right in here. Um, sorry, no, it's this pit right in here. It's, this is the mean for the two combined minus the grand mean plus the individual treatment effects right there. Um, we kind of saw that before uh, when we were looking at this kind of interaction here where when you get K and U together, it winds up being a lower mean VOT than when you put the grand mean plus the K treatment plus the U treatment. That's how we're getting the interaction treatments here. And let's take a look at some of those. For right-handed batters, right-handed pitchers, I get an effect of negative 0.02. So, hmm, that's kind of interesting because already... Already, these are bigger numbers than what we saw up here. And then if I take a look at right-handed pitchers and right-handed batters and left-handed pitchers, and hmm, boom, this goes up, but also I'm still getting the same number as I got before. Huh, let's take a look at all these to see what, oh, look at that. It's exactly the same as the other mismatch combo up here, the exact same number. And then if I look at this one, whoa, What's going on? This is the exact same number as this one is. Well, <clears throat> drink of water. What's going on here is the issue of degrees of freedom, uh, which we've talked about at some length. Uh, basically, um, if you calculate an overall average, say, for all the batters in the database, and then you want to say, well, uh, I'm going to look at the treatment of, you know, how much does that average go up and down for right-handed batters? figure out that by itself, and then also figure out how much does that average go up and down for left-handed batters. Since I'm splitting the entire universe of batters up into just two types of batters, righties and lefties, uh, however much the righties go up, the lefties have to go down or vice versa, right? Um, because we're just comparing these numbers to the overall average. And the overall average is just these two put together. So it has to balance out to zero at the end of the, at the, end of the day, basically. Um, same thing for pitchers. There's only one degree of freedom there. Uh, there's only one degree of freedom for um, batters because we have two levels, right? Righty and lefty. The degrees of freedom is two minus one. It's just one. Same thing for the pitchers. And the way we calculate degrees of freedom for the interaction uh, is by multiplying those two degrees of freedom together. So two minus one in parentheses times two minus one in parentheses. We just get one degree of freedom. So um, there's some variation you can get 
either up or down um, for each one of these interactions, but the uh, magnitude of that uh, deviation is gonna be the same across all four of these groupings. We're just gonna get two that go negative and two that go positive because there's only one degree of freedom in this particular case. Hmm. You can try it again with a similar setup, uh, different data. It's all gonna work out the same way with slightly different numbers, I'm sure. Um, that's what's going on with the treatment effects. Okay, that's just the start of what we want here. Um, we can also take a look at how much sort of variance there is here or what the sum of squares is, uh, kind of the old fashioned way with our null model um, by just looking at the individual observations of average minus the overall grand mean, square those summed or square those deviations and sum them, we get a total of 0.327, which doesn't mean a whole lot. Um, like if you go back to this database, like most of these numbers are gonna be around 0 0.5, 0 0.4. Um, I see one, a couple here at 0 0.36, so on and so forth. Right, uh, yeah, so that it doesn't matter what the magnitude is exactly, uh, it's just some number. Uh, but we know that out of this total um, sum of squares, we're gonna be able to divide it up into a predictable part and a residual part that's not predictable. Uh, and the way we're gonna do it is by setting up this model, which has these two main factors of batter and pitcher, uh, and then their possible interaction in terms of their handedness. So to do that, um, we need to calculate the error sum of squares. Um, and I'll do this for all four of these groupings and then show you exactly kind of what's going on. Um, it might be easier to see this way. Uh, so this is, if you remember for the interaction treatments, uh, we were looking at the mean for the actual interactions and then we were subtracting from that um, kind of our combined model here with the grand mean plus the two main effect treatment effects. Um, over here, uh, we're taking the individual observations. So we're no longer dealing with the mean uh, in any case. And we're subtracting that from that, what we had before the grand mean and the two main effect treatments, and then also the treatment for that specific interaction. So in this case, I'm just looking at uh, the combination of right-handed batters, right-handed pitchers, and I'm just trying to figure out how much or variation is left over, how much deviation there is between the individual observations and what we can predict based on this sort of model. Uh, and then I square those deviations uh, and then sum them all. If you remember the previous lecture or previous part of this lecture, this is the bit where we're trying to figure out where these residual errors are here in gray. So we build this kind of relatively complex model with the grand mean, the alpha treatment, the beta treatment, and then the interaction treatment. And there's still a little bit of residual variance left over. In this particular case, it went down. Up here, it would go up. Here, it'd be about the same. Um, but that's what we're trying to calculate. And then mathematically, it's all this stuff in here. Uh, so we got the whole model here um, the predictable part of the model here in parentheses, and we're just subtracting that from whatever uh, the actual observation is. So this is the deviation between uh, what we expect, what we can predict, and what we actually get. Uh, okay, so we got that. We're gonna get different numbers here for each combination. If I take a look at this, um, there will be interesting things going on uh, that make each one of these groupings differ from each other. Uh, so there's not just one degree of freedom here, there's actually quite a bit of degrees of freedom. Um, and I've got um, those numbers here down at the bottom, but to actually make this work in the two-way ANOVA model, um, I need to add up all these groupings, kind of to go back here, this is sort of like, the first step is the um, iterate from one to n, the number of observations in each of these groupings. Uh, and then I got to do it twice for each factor. So the J factor and the I factor, or the whatever, alpha sub I factor and the beta sub J factor. Uh, and that, and then I, when I sum all those up, uh, I just add all the different groupings together and I get my total error sum of squares, which is 0.245, whatever. Um, so out of the total error of 3.327, um, I'm getting a residual error of 0.245. So uh, it looks like, I don't know, about 75% um, of this total error is still kind of unpredictable, which I guess is part of what makes baseball a fun game. It's not totally controllable and a lot happens that you don't expect, even though it's very routine if you've ever watched a game. Um, but be that as it may, that's just what we got. Um, when we crunch the numbers, I'm going to point out here that the degrees uh, the degrees of freedom are going to be two times two 
Uh, so two handednesses for batters, two handednesses for pitchers. And then there are 30 teams in the database. Um, so subtract one from that. These are This is my N, basically, how many observations I get within each pairing of handednesses. So two times two times 30 minus one equals 116. That's how many degrees of freedom I have for my residual sum of squares, uh, which is the same thing as this right here. Okay, um, that's kind of the boring part because like I said, uh, or at least for you know trying to come up with a model because this is the stuff that we can't predict. Uh, and now what I wanna do is calculate uh, treatment sums of squares. And I'm gonna do this explicitly for the main effects so you can see kind of exactly what's happening here. Um, and this, it might be a little bit confusing. So what I've got is um, I'm going to take um, the deviations and kind of plot this out in a slightly different way. Uh, so this is trying to calculate this number here. Uh, and like I said, uh, you start out with the deviation between the factor level mean and the grand mean, which would be, say, the mean of the right-handed batters minus the overall mean and you square that here. Uh, and then you also, since this is a summation, you gotta do that for the other factor level, which is say the left-handed batter's average minus the grand mean average. Uh, and you square that. So uh, I could you know, extract this 60 out to the front of this. Maybe I should. Eh, yeah, let's just make sure that actually works. The 60 um, just is coming from how many times we repeat this for each grouping of right-handed and left-handed batters. So uh, like each team, there are 30 teams in the database. And for each team, there are two observations for lefties, left-handed batters and two observations for righties. So 30 times two winds up being 60. Um, that's just how the math works. And I guess, let me see if I can get this to work if I don't screw myself up here. Um, I think I can, yeah, I can factor out that. 60 in the middle, like this, I should get the same thing. Yeah, so uh, that might make it look a little bit more comprehensible. These are just the number of repetitions I have. Um, and this is sort of the first part of my summation, the first iteration of that, factor level one. Uh, and this is factor level two. And I square that before I add the whole thing, or add the whole thing up 60 times. Uh, that's where that's coming from. That's my batter sum of squares. Uh, and then I have my pitcher sum of squares, which I'll calculate in a very similar way. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and we can take a look at that. Oops, maybe. Yeah, so we've got 0.327 in terms of total variance we have to contend with. 0.245 of that is error variance. 0.001 a very small amount is coming from the batters. 0.007 is coming from the pitchers. It looks like the pitcher makes more of a difference than the batter here. But we also have our interaction sum of squares. So how do we calculate that? I'm going to do this kind of easy way uh, so you don't have to look at as many parentheses in this equation or, or maybe not any at all. Um, but I'm adding or squaring up the treatment effects for each of the combinations. So... In this case, I said the treatment effect alpha sub i, beta sub j is this stuff here. Uh, I'm just kind of going straight for this and I'm going to uh, substitute all this business in the actual equation with this uh, as I calculate it for each of the four combinations. And for each of the four combinations, we see them 30 times in this database because there's 30 teams uh, and they see each of these combinations once. So if I do that, I get my treatment sum of squares for the interaction, which is pretty big. It's 0.073, and it's all bigness here is all relative, right? So compared to these other treatment effects, it looks much larger. So maybe something's going on there. Uh, and again, I'm not going to do this, but if I add up this along with the main effect sum of squares and the treatment sum of squares, um, or the interaction sums of squares, then I would get 0.327 at the end of the day. Uh, I'll leave that for you to do as an exercise at home. For now, what we need to do is calculate F ratios or the mean square for each treatment term, which is its sum of squares divided by its degrees of freedom. Um, yeah, so if I were to do that 
part of this would wind up being really boring. So the degrees of freedom for the main effects is one. Um, so, right, if I divide those by one, it doesn't do anything, right? So it's just kind of a waste of time. The error sum of squares, though, we divide by those 116 degrees of freedom. So it goes from being 0.245 to something a lot smaller, uh, which is kind of reassuring because um, to get a significant effect, we want to see if like a number like 0 0.001 is uh, the ratio between 0 0.001 and 0.002 is significantly different from one. Um, in this case, probably not, but who knows, right? At least it's a lot closer than like 0.001 and 0.245. Uh, that's going in the wrong direction because we want our predictable variance to be bigger than our error variance. Um, what do we actually get if we crank this out for the batters? We get an F ratio of 0.585. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Sounds like my daughter has discovered the recorder downstairs and there are terrible sounds emerging from the, li li the living room. Hopefully it has nothing to do with this lecture. Uh, anyways, this is our F ratio. So again, um, we hope that this is a ratio considerably bigger than one. We have to sort of normalize that with respect to the degrees of freedom involved, but this one is not bigger than one, so it's not promising. This one is, is 3.72. So who knows, maybe that's gonna give us something. And if we look at the last ratio for the interaction, we get an F ratio of 34.65572. So this looks like it's almost definitely going to be bigger than one and a significant effect for that reason. But to make sure, what we can do is plot that ratio into the PF function. Uh, and I'll show you kind of two ways to do this. This is just kind of um, using a shortcut and typing in the numbers. Uh, and if I do that, I get a p-value of 0.4455, which is not lower than 0.05. So this is not a significant effect. Uh, and just for, you know, clarity's sake, what you can do in this case is plot the direct calculation of the F ratio in there and let R do the dirty work for you. Um, and when I do that, uh, it's going to give us a, a more exact number for that F ratio and I get a slightly different P value, but it's basically the same as what I did before. Uh, but either way, it's bigger than 0.05, so um, that's not significant. Uh, I can calculate a P value for the F ratio for the pitchers, and we see that it's close. It's 0.056, it was almost lower than 0.05, but not quite. So it looks like pitchers are close to making a difference, but not in a significant way. At least that's not how we'd interpret it. Uh, and then lastly, we can do the um, p-value for the interaction F ratio. And this, it turns out, is a very, very small number. So this is definitely a bigger ratio than one. Um, this is uh, whatever, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's this number. Um, so it's definitely smaller than 0.05. The interaction is definitely having a significant effect on average overall um, for these teams as they try to make their way to first base and beyond. Uh, so what can we infer from the results of these tests? Doesn't matter if the batters and pitchers are batting and pitching with the same hand. Uh, yes, it does. And maybe the easiest way to explain this is to go back to the graph. And basically what this is telling us is that these numbers here are bigger than the numbers on the edges. So when there's mismatch handedness, uh, we're getting bigger numbers overall than we have on the sides. But we don't actually know this for sure yet because all we've done is run, run the ANOVA. We have to run um, the post hoc test to kind of verify that. Uh, but basically what this is saying as a result is that when I plot out the data like this, that not all of four of the, not all four of these groups are the same. Um, yeah, and so I was kind of skipping a step there, but I'll address that in the next part of this lecture on post hoc tests. But for now, it's saying that um, the mean of this group is not equal, or means of these groups are not all equal to each other. There are differences there. Um, and But if we were to plot, say, um, just the batter groups, um, then we'd accept the null hypothesis in that case. So doing something boring like this, getting rid of the picture part of this, and just say plot the batters. Oh, look at that. They're the same. Um, there's no significant difference there. Or if I just plot the pitchers, we might see something that looks close to being different, uh, but statistically it's not. 
Um, so yeah, the excitement is in the combination. And like I said, we'll dig into the exact differences as we go into the next lecture, but this is saying these are not all equal to each other. Uh, yeah, and to show you the easy way to do that before you lose faith in me completely, um, we've seen the syntax of this before. What we're going to see here is some numbers that hopefully look similar or familiar. So like our degrees of freedom, we calculated those. We're looking at familiar sums of squares, so on and so forth. These are our F values that we calculated before plopping them into the P function, which gave us these P values. Uh, <laughs> that recorder's still going. All right, a new passion has been found downstairs while I did this lecture. Uh, I will also point out, um, this gives you the kind of like the almost notation. Uh, oh, almost got a P value that meant something there. Because for R, um, it's just less than 0.1. Um, so if you had a very sort of liberal uh, alpha criterion there, you'd get a significant effect for pitcher. But the one we care about is the one with three stars, grand slam home run for the interaction effect. Uh, and we'll look at that a bit more later next time. Um, also point out, uh, as long as I'm here, uh, there's this set of commands that uh, I dug up in a textbook somewhere but have almost never used since. But you can kind of convert um, your model into a printout of the means of everything that matter for each of the different factors, uh, which is sort of convenient maybe, but just in case, just so you know. Uh, again, the one that matters is here, where it looks like the matching handednesses give us a very low mean, and the mismatching handednesses give us a big mean. Um, yeah, and uh, right, I'm also going to do the linear models, which we've seen before. Um, this is the linear regression model, looking at how average depends on batter, pitcher, and the combination of these two factors. Everything looks significant if I do it this way, um, but you can compare that to a model where we get rid of that interaction and then nothing becomes significant. <laughs> and I get slight changes here in my degrees of freedom and sums of squares and so on and so forth. Uh, we talked about this at some length. I'm not gonna dwell on it further right now. Um, I can show you in another um, lecture how to interpret this exactly, but uh, for now I'll just say this estimate for the intercept is this value right here. It's uh, the combination of lefties and lefties. And the only reason it's that particular combination is because L comes first in the alphabet before R. Uh, so we start there and then we build on top of that, say how much does being a right-handed batter affect that? A little bit. Uh, how much does this combination affect that? So on and so forth. Uh, either way, what I wanna just focus on for the moment is that, um, yeah, actually I missed it for now. I thought I had um, an R squared value for the combination. But actually, I think I've talked enough about baseball for now. Uh, yeah, don't know what happened there. There was something else I wanted to show you, but I can't. So we'll just put a, put a rest to it for now and say that we have a significant interaction here. Uh, and the next step we have to take is analyzing it with post hoc tests which we've seen in part before, but we're gonna have to go a little bit more involved because we have more than three, three factors involved, or more than three levels of one factor involved in this particular case. Okay, but that's what an interaction looks like um, from the world of baseball, and you'll probably see it somewhere in the world of linguistics somewhere soon too. All right, till next time.